My name's Nick. I'm the owner of Kevlar Joe's and I'm the roaster. I'm an Air Force Security Forces veteran, a dad to three wild boys, and a husband to my wife, Crystal, and a coffee enthusiast. From a family in a small town in Missouri, we started with the simple idea of crafting a perfectly bold cup of coffee. Inspired by wellness and countless pots of stale coffee while deployed, we wanted to craft a bold, clean, and smooth coffee. So we did. And we realized we wanted to share this coffee with our friends. Lord knows we could all use a good cup of coffee right about now. From the farm to your coffee cup, there's nothing like a good, well-crafted, and bold cup of coffee. No matter what time of the day, it's there to pick you up, motivate you, and relax you. We hope you enjoy our coffee. Be bold, be humble, be Kevlar. And you can find Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company anytime you want at www.kevlarjoe.com. And for listeners of the Dig Bible Podcast, use the code, all caps, DIG20, whenever you're checking out to get a 20% off discount. Enjoy. This is David Paxton from The Hidden Day, and you're listening to The Dig Bible Podcast. We should read our Bible as men digging for buried treasure. The Bible is the world's most popular enigma. Its secrets lost to cultures beneath the sands of time. Or is it? It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. God wants you to seek, to read his word, to to look for that knowledge. He wants you to do that. And the people at Nicaea, they like chopped out 80 books of the Bible. We need to bring those back. More bad guys in this thing than a Bruce Willis. Oh yeah. Let's back it up here. I, I love the intro to your show because it's exactly right. There's these nuggets of gold in his word. As you guys always say in the show, you, you gotta dig it. Dig it. Show us your nuggets. God, our creator, lies outside of time and space and matter. I, know, I feel like God would be like, hello, McFly. You ain't got it so far, then. There are secret societies think that they are the descendants of the giant. I mean, isn't, isn't this exciting? I mean, you read it, it's like, wow. The Nephilology round table. But these angels were taken to help immediately. Do not pass gold, do not collect $200. You're out of the game. Dirty hands means clean theology. Can you dig it? What's going on, all my local guys and gals? And long distance pals. We're back. <laughs> we ain't going to get it this week. I tell you, that. That's, What's wrong? That's just, that's. I don't know, testosterone, son, testosterone. Yeah. Well, just, you know, now that we know we're looking at this hindsight, this is after our one-year anniversary show, and uh, the catchphrases took on. We actually even had a guy said, what's going on, long-distance pals? <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess I'm Ben Foot. Ben Foot. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been one year already, ain't it? It, Yeah. You know, in some ways it seems like it just started. In other ways, it seems like we've been doing this a long time. It really does. At times, you feel like you get in a routine, but but yeah, it's been it's been a crazy year. Well, I guess looking back, what was uh, your guys' favorite show? If you had to play favorites, mm. I really don't know. Or favorite show, favorite guest. Now, that's not Not fair. just season one or season two, just as a whole for the year. Uh, so we've all had people that I think we connected There's, with maybe yeah. a little bit more, but at the same time, there, uh, 
I have to thank every guest that's ever been on here. It's been so good, and I've, I think I've learned so much from each person. But um, I guess one of my favorites, and, and no offense to anybody else out there, but one of my favorites definitely is Ryan Peterson. Absolutely love the guy, his knowledge, his, his, the way that he uses Scripture to back everything up, that he, he, his ideas, his beliefs, which are different than a lot of other people that we, as far as the um, fallen angels and some of those things, like different ideas and, and the final Nephilim, Judgment of the Nephilim, go out and read those books. Just absolutely chocked full of information. Just loved it. Yeah, he's real down to earth. I I love just it's just like sitting down with an old high school friend and talking with him. Yeah, he was he was easy to you know communicate with. Oh yeah, I know. Was it Al Marino? Al Marino? Yeah, Al Marino. Yeah, I liked him pretty good. Yeah, uh, but but I liked the uh, the Ben Stein. He. I mean, because yeah. we weren't expecting that. Yeah, Brad. Brad or Brad Stein, Stein yeah. yeah. Stein, Bueller. Yeah. Bueller. <laughs> you know, I wasn't Bueller. expecting that at all. Um, I mean, he just came with energy. Yeah, yeah. he had some fire. Yeah. I love, I love, and we think we saw that with so many of the guests that we have, just the passion that they have behind what they do, their research, their belief, and, and how much you can see God working through them and everything that they do and the books they write and the – the, the shows that they've produced, the movies they've done, the, the the force of God behind them and what they're doing and not caring what other people think, but doing God's work. And it's just awesome to see so many strong Christian people out there that are making a difference in any way they can, using the gifts that God gave them. Which I love all this. I love the interviews because, uh, I mean, I read all these guys' books and watch their you know YouTube videos and stuff like that. So it's like once we started this and actually being – a part of the conversation and talking to these guys it was like uh i'm like a little kid living their dream you know i mean I'm, it's like i got to step on the court with michael jordan uh but Derek gilbert you know me and him were you know were friends for quite a few years before i started this so we already had kind of a friendship built up so i really enjoyed having him on the show but i guess my personal favorite was uh trey smith because uh i grew up believing in the faith and but I never really got deep into the, the supernatural or, you know, the Hebrew, just kind of the, I guess, quote unquote, weird things until I found his YouTube channel. And then that's how I actually found Derek Gilbert and some of these other guys uh, was through Trey Smith because he had interviewed him and talked to him. So it was really cool to get to talk to Trey Smith and me and him actually become friends. We actually text and talk on the phone and stuff. So that was... Uh, probably my favorite that was my fanboy moment i guess no fanboy i yeah. think it's cool though when you think about the the fact that that we've been so blessed through this that each of these people like you talk about Derek gilbert and I absolutely love Derek. one of the nicest most down-to-earth people there is and the amount of knowledge when you walk away, it, it, there are certain things that just made you go, whoa. I mean, that's unbelievable. And there's other things that I'm still scratching my head like, he needs to say that again. Because <laughs> yeah. it just, it was just so much all at once. And, but the knowledge and the, the, the chance that, you know, that we get to sit down and, and talk to some of these people and, and be able to listen to everything that you know, this, we get to ask the questions we want to ask. Not everybody's that lucky. We can sit down and ask these people exactly what's been our mind. Well, what do you think about this? Boom. And and I just love that because there's so much knowledge in each of the people that we've had on this program and in different areas and in different uh, spectrums and different viewpoints. But like I said, always backed up with scripture. And, you know, it's some of that's interpretive, you know, in some of that ways. But the end goal is that these people may have differences in opinion on certain things, but they're all non-salvation issues. But if it's helped at all to push you to read your Bible more, to dig into God's word more, to, to try to search out that truth, you know, that, that God conceals in his word, then, man, it, it's, it's done something that we wanted it to do because it's done that for all of us. So I just, to me, it's been just truly a blessing. And on top of that, absolutely love the interviews love the guests but 
the other shows that we've done, the other, the Bible study that, I mean, that was one of Ben's ideas that I think has been just phenomenal, not only just for, you know, to as something we can sit down and, and do like we would in church, like a small group or something, but we're, we're learning as we go just with us here, you know, being able to bounce ideas off each other, being able to kind of see how we each interpret what we read. And I feel that God speaks to everybody a little bit differently in his word, the way that he speaks to you, the way you interpret it, the way that he wants you to understand something may be a little different than he wants me to. That's the Bible's the most amazing living book there is on this planet that continually God will speak to you through it. Even if you're reading the same couple passages. That's what I was about to say. It's funny because you can say, you know, Oh, I've read, I've read Matthew a hundred times. Read it again, and something else will pop out at you. It's it's like, it's like watching a movie, and you're like, I don't remember that happening. You know, the first two times you watched it, mm -hmm. you know, it's just it's, it's been an awesome journey, for sure. Truth is in the journey. Yeah, and what what I think's great about, like say the interviews is, I know we've said it before. I don't know if we've said it on air or not, but it's it's wild to watch them. You know, they're, I wouldn't say all of them, but I'm sure some of them's like, okay, I'll, well, I'll talk to this guy, these guys. I don't know who they are, you know, and they, they, they come in with low expectations. Yeah. <laughs> then they see our right. studio. Yeah. Th well, then that's even lower expectations. Yeah. Bar lowers yeah. a little yeah. more. But, but, Ten minutes into the conversation, you can you can see that their attitude slash ideas that they first got of us change. Yeah, their eyes light up. Yeah, and <laughs> it, it's you know it's not. Oh, these are you know listening to me anyway. He's like that's a dumb hillbilly. <laughs> but but you, you think about it though in the same yeah, way. Yeah, it's it's just like was it Peterson said, know your Bible. And isn't he the one who said that? Alberino was talking about the or gospel. Alberino. Well, no, yeah, no, Peterson said that. Talking about having a conversation. Yeah, when he came back on with us, he said, I oh, just yeah, done an interview yeah. with another podcast, yeah. and I was their first interview, so they were nervous as can be, and they asked me, you know, what, what makes a good interview? He said, I automatically thought of you brothers. Yeah. He said, and I told him, he said, just know your Bible. He yeah. Said, Them guys know their Bible. He said, we just feed off each other. It, it's, yeah. Because it's the, it's the main topic you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus, Bible, the God, you know, God and all that stuff. So I just think that, you know, it's just been awesome. I think I'm going to make you a sticker that says that. Jesus, what? the Bible of God and all that stuff. And all that yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. It's a, it's a T-shirt. Uh, Which I like. We'll, we'll get a logo going. You know what? A lot of these guys are, are so humble. You yeah. Know, like Derek, if anybody had the... Uh, excuse to hi-hat somebody and ignore them not reply to emails no i'm too good or i'm too busy it's Derek gilbert you know he writes all the time he's studying all the time he's got several podcasts he runs he's got the Derek gilbert uh, app and uh, youtube busy. channel you know he works for skywatch tv that man always responds to emails that man always says yes to, to coming on shows and that you know, I mean, a lot of these guys are that we've dealt with. They're just very humble, and I love that about them because there's been several, you know, podcasters and other authors that I've reached out to and tried to, you know, work with and ask them to come on the show, or and they just either Ignore not you. respond yeah. at all or, oh, I'm too busy. My schedule's too busy. But then you'll see them on other podcasts right. and stuff. You know what I mean? Hi-hat you. And it's like, man... If you ain't got time, you know, whatever, just but don't don't just ignore people and act like you're just too good, you know, because if anybody had that luxury, it'd be like Derek Gilbert and Ryan Peterson, some of these guys that, that are just so humble, you know. Well, Al Barino, yeah, L.A. Marzulli, you can go down the list, all these guys that we've, that, uh, uh, and girls. I, Vicky Joy Anderson was another one of my favorites uh, that we got. You we didn't have yeah. to get to be with us that time, and we had the, the, uh, the that craziest was computer yeah. issues and everything happened that night and i'm I, surprised the power didn't cut it off. was it was like there was somebody that did not want that information to get out and i'd tell you that was 
she, her information, her now, all those things, everybody has been so gracious, like you said, so humble and yet just so knowledgeable. And it has changed me. It sculpted me to understand scripture better, to, to dive in better. But all these people have brought something different to the table. Yeah. I've, I've like I, I've loved every single one of them, and I loved having them as part of uh, um, like Tom Dunn and then Ryan Peterson again for the you know coming on um, Brian Gadawa working with us on the the um, Bible uh, the Bible study having them as part of that I don't, Judd Burton uh, who can you can never leave Judd Burton not, the knowledge that guy has is unbelievable you go down that whole list there's just so many great resources and great down to earth people that you know if you reach out. They'll answer your questions. They, they want to talk to somebody. You know, George Carneal is like, email me. If you have questions, email me. Talk to me. Like, it's just everybody has been so gracious, so humble, and they're doing God's work. And that's the whole point is that, and I think that, that the majority of people in this space, you know, like you said, Trey and, and, and these other people that, we, that we've talked to are truly they know this is their place. They know that their work is to further, you know, the Great Commission in the long run and, and, and going along this track that we've been with them on and, and, and pushing, you know, just all these different, this information and knowledge that is stuff that, um, you know, a lot of people don't dig for themselves and they need to be spoon fed a little bit. And uh, I think the whole goal that we set out for was to, Get people past the spoon feeding. Give them a taste. Give them a slap taste. Slap them on the butt. Remember, get into the meat and potatoes. I think we talked about that way back in the beginning. Yeah. We're, we're past the milk. We're going in the meat and potatoes. So I think that it's just such a cool thing to be a part of, to get to talk to some of these people that I just, I never in my wildest dreams would I think we would have ever had the chance to do. Well, I like how Vicki Joy Anderson said uh, in our uh, anniversary show that we done, she said, the Great Commission wasn't to go out and make subscribers. Mm-hmm. It was to make disciples. She said, and I pray that the listeners of today are the disciples of tomorrow. Because, you know, you got a lot of people, you know, even in this circle that we're in, they're just trying to build subscribers and stack cash. That, that ain't what we're supposed to be doing here. No. Nope, nope, nope. But anyways, back it up. Let's open up prayer, and we'll get into this week's episode, uh, Astrology and Astronomy in the Bible. I guess this will be part two. Who part prayed two. last time? I did, didn't I? Yeah. It's one of you two's turn. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for letting us have this opportunity and, and the, the gifts and the blessings that you have that, that we get to do something like this to help spread your word, to try to reach just that one more person, you know, empty, empty out hell and populate heaven. If you can continue, please, if, it, if it's your will, keep continuing to bless this and, and, and reach the people that you need it to reach, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So astrology and astronomy in the Bible, we talked about uh, how the story of salvation was written in the stars last time. So this time we're just going to go into uh, where we, instances where we see that uh, in our canon in the Bible. And you don't have to go very far. You get into Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. You know, God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. You know, Scripture tells us that the stars were created as signs and seasons, days and years. It's a perfect clock or calendar. The sun's the hour hand, the moon is the day of the month, and the constellations for the seasons. So even in the beginning, we're told that uh, the stars and the moon, all those were put in the heavens for signs and for seasons. Uh Acts chapter 2 verse 19 says I will show wonders in heaven above talking about the signs uh, Psalms 19 2 through 1 the heavens declare the glory of God day to day it pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge you know the ancients have been mapping and looking to the heavens since the beginning of time they're finding you know ancient architecture aligning with the stars as far back as Gobekli Tepe and we talked about that with uh, Aaron Judkins 
You know, but these were supposed to be the, the stupid caveman hunter gatherers. But history tells a quite a different, you know, story. Mm-hmm. Um Isaiah forty seven thirteen says, Those who divide the heavens who gaze at the stars, you know, somewhere along the line and we've hinted around this on other episodes, but somewhere along the line this intent and knowledge was perverted. You know, Romans one twenty five, they traded the truth for a lie and worshiped the created things instead of the creator. Uh but it says in Acts seven four two, but God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the host of heaven. You know, here we got the uh, Tower of Babel. Mm-hmm. You know, they were chasing after these other gods and stuff, so God just turned them over to the, the, the will of their hearts, and they worshiped the stars of heaven. But, you know, we have uh, before that, you know, it was Genesis 6, and that's where, you know, I believe that the knowledge was perverted. It was, you know, it was talked about in creation, but then these fallen angels came down, and it says in, in the book of Enoch that they trained them in the art of uh, astrology you know mathematics war you know even uh, beautification of the eyelids and even abortion so they ended up uh, twisted a created thing and told them that they were to to be worshipped and they were gods Uh, you guys uh, think of anything that stands up at the top of your head like far as astrology astronomy in the bible exactly what you just said is the part that that always blows me away is that you can walk into a you know a grocery store and get your zodiac and and it'll tell you you know all the the different things that the stars tell you based on hercules and you know and 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 things like this and the stars that that are perversions of god's creation and and to think that you know if you truly think about this god created those things he didn't create those things so you could turn them into a, 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 a novelty, you know, a, a fortune cookie, you know, little <laughs> little message that says, "Oh, you'll have plenty of money because you're an Aries or well, these I, kind of things." I have a question: Does do they always say? Do they ever say you're going to have a horrible day today? You you better watch out. Don't spend no money. Or is it always good stuff? I don't. I mean, because I don't ever look at it. I don't know. I do You're not remember, supposed like, to look at you know, it. When I was younger in my heathen years, I'd look, just kind of look at that stuff. But it said, uh, I remember seeing stuff like, like it'll have vague stuff. Like it'll say, you know, uh, the such and such star is in this constellation at this time. This is not a good omen for you. So at this time, don't make any major investments. You know, and it's not your time. You know, and little, little stuff like that, you know. That's... That's all it, the witches and stuff yeah, do. They it, give it, you really it, vague stuff. That that just made me think about. I was listening to, I believe it was Skip Isaac the other day, and one of his, I can't remember which books it is, but it's I, Daniel, I guess probably, where Daniel, they, uh, the king has his little dream, and he can't remember his dream, so he sends you know bring me all these people. Yeah. Tell me what my dream is and what does it mean? When he they're like, Daniel out of prison. Yeah, well, they're like, well, um, well, you have to tell us your dream so we can interpret it. He says, no, I don't remember my dream. If you're these seers. Well, he remembered it. He just told them, if you're truly a seer, then I don't need to tell you. Well, either way. Yeah. You know, tell me. Tell me what I dreamed and what does it mean? And they couldn't do it. They said, well, no person on earth can do, you know, tell the future. And it's the same, the same thing. Like, look, you're looking at them stars. Is it going to tell you that, hey, tomorrow you play these numbers on the lottery and you're going to win big? Well, I think that that's the point, though. As you just said it, I think you hit that nail on the head. No person on earth yeah. can do that. However, go to Acts, and we talk about Paul and that, that uh, slave yeah, that we, just, that, talked about that, that we yeah. just talked about. That that girl could tell the future, but it's not be, it's not her that's telling the future. Right. It was the demon inside her, so no one of this earth. But you still see that, that, that these, these um, some of these... At least some of these uh, demonic entities, fallen angels, whatever is possessing her, 
has ability for some limited foresight to some degree. What? It was, they were making him tons of money. She was making yeah. the owners tons well, of money. Well, it could be upset. also <laughs> it yes. could also be foresight of the of the fact of the demons in that region and and say 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 I'm um, you know hey tomorrow if you don't if you don't pay me if you don't give the king twenty thousand dollars tomorrow your dad's gonna die. <laughs> and then he just the guy goes off and offs his dad. Because he didn't give them twenty thousand, not you know, they like were real superstitious people back then. I mean, they were. Well, I'm just saying livers, on the demon, the like blood, how it flowed, yeah. and yeah, no, you know, I all don't. this different stuff back then. I, no, <laughs> well, I'm glad you don't believe in that. No, then. no, they're that's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Which I guess one I want to talk about, and we we've touched on it with Derek Gilbert was uh, Isaiah 14, and then Ezekiel 28. You know, so now that we got kind of got a little bit of a, a groundwork laid, but it said that Satan himself was was have said to have walked amongst the stones of fire, in Ezekiel twenty eight. You know, to me that stands out as the uh, the stars and the planets, because they you know they're associated with celestial beings anyway. You know, Mercury, Jupiter, Zeus, Aries for, you know, Mars. Just all these different gods were associated with these planets anyway. And it talked about where Satan walked amongst the stones of fire. But uh, Isaiah 14, the famous Lucifer passage, you know, refers to the planet Venus. You know, it's not Satan. It's a proper name. We recently released that Derek Gilbert show. Uh, if you ain't checked that out, check that out. But it's really good. But it's a, a mistranslation from the uh, Latin Vulgate where the original Greek word was herphoros, which means light bringer. You know, it was the brightest star in the sky just before the sunrise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this entity, whether it was Satan himself or Shimjaza, you know, as Derek uh, talked about, um, this planet was aligned with the entity that rebelled against God. In Isaiah fourteen thirty three. you know, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. You know, a.k.a. the divine assembly, the divine council. You know, uh, Psalms 148, 1 through 4. Praise him from the heavens. Praise him, sun and the moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. You know, the ones in the divine council who rebelled that will be judged. You know, that we see many times that stars' language is equated to, to heavenly beings in the Bible. Uh, like in Job, you know, yeah. when the morning stars sang for joy, you know, at, at creation when, you know, God laid the foundations of the earth. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty rife through there. I mean, you even have judgment of these celestial beings in your scripture. Uh, Matthew twenty four twenty nine: sun, moon, and stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. You know, we talked about this in the last episode uh, where you're talking about written in the stars. Job 38, 31 through 33. Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loosen the cord of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you establish their rule on earth? You know, this is Job, the oldest book in the Bible. But the last line tells me that the Tower of Babel had already happened. That whole passage was mentioning heavenly bodies and, and their constellations. I never noticed that till I was doing this. Well, yeah, because if it. he's, if the fallen angels gave us the knowledge of the stars and whatnot, then I guess that would make sense. Job would be after that. Yeah. Because he's already naming them by name. And I mean, I don't know. Yeah, but that just just going not, off the knowledge that we Job. know. That's God talking to Job, right? But I'm just saying. I mean, if he's telling him that, then he already knows about it. He's talking to him like, you know, where were you when I done this and done that? So, like the way I understood it anyway was like Job was already well aware of it because God was talking to him about it like mm -hmm. he already knew. That makes me wonder, though. It does. Would they, you know, if we go back to Genesis, and we look at God talks about, you know, a, you know, that uh, Adam named the animals and named these things, and 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 had, uh, 
you know, dominion on earth, I guess, you know, we said that until later on when that's given to Satan through sin. Yeah, we but traded. We traded. <laughs> but um, I, that makes me wonder if that's something that God imparted the knowledge of the, and, and it's not in the Bible, so it's just me conjecture, but did, did it everybody, could be. did they know that from day one? Did God tell Adam and Eve, not day one, but you know what I mean? Did God sit down when they were walking through the garden and go out at night and they're starting like, hey, hey, so this is that. Look, at, this is my promise, you know, or maybe after the fall, because that's when the the prophecy of, uh, uh, the you know, Genesis 315, which is written in the stars all over the place. Did he let him know that? Look, at this is a sign of my covenant with you. We said this, but look, I have it written here because I knew this was going to happen. I don't know. I mean, it's just an idea. Oh, yeah. And it, um, and that possibly could be because it says they were, they taught us the workings of the stars or whatever, right? Yeah. So, so their courses. And- yeah. Well, we might not have known the courses. We just, you know, God might have just said, hey, this is what this is. And, and kind of let it be. Mm-hmm. And then the angels that fu- that you know come down the fallen angels kind of went into more detail told us stuff that god didn't want us to know at the time I possibility i mean no. you know obviously we don't know but i could see it that way also i think it'd be, that'd be a good question for Derek gilbert right there yeah. it would be write that down hey if you're listening <laughs> Derek, let us know email us <laughs> just call justin i mean just make it easy <laughs> Which Y'all I, are pen pals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which I shared this on the uh, Facebook community, but I don't think we've actually like went in depth and talked about it. But uh, So if you're not a member of the Facebook community, you're you, missing out. You just got FOMO'd. What does that mean? Fear of missing out. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, it, it must be a... There was know. a schism in that, that uh, joke there. I'm... I'm older than both you guys. I don't, I don't know <laughs> well, well, he's got kids that are. Yeah. See, my kids are too young to be bringing that home. Maybe, maybe that's like a new lingo. You like how we had fat back in the day? Yeah. Well, I'll make it more. I, I still have. I'll it. make it more palatable for you. <laughs> Wrong fat. <laughs> I'll make it more palatable. Yeah. But uh, the Israelite camp in Genesis 49. We all know about the, when they he called them out and he told them, you know, give them specific instructions on how to lay their camp out and all that stuff. Right. Well, uh, there was uh, astronomical things tied into that as well. Uh, but when they were uh, wild, when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, you know, this was a on earth as it is in heaven mirrored image. And we talked a little bit about that, I think, on that episode me and you was talking about and how that it was laid out as a big cross it was a moving cross on the floor of the desert you know with the holiest of holies in the center but what's crazy is and it's kind of how the new heaven the gates of heaven or something's going to be laid out and well, then so, we get to something something in revelations it it oh but yeah, mirrors the, it the 12 uh 12 gates yeah. or something but see uh let's see well, if we back up from there to genesis 49 that's the uh, blessings of, of Jacob to his children. But it says uh, right there there was 12 tribes, and that's what you're talking about, the 12 tribes and 12 gates of Israel. But uh, if you read the blessings in that chapter, Judah was referred to as a lion, and Reuben was referred to as a man with water. Uh, Ephraim, which is Joseph, uh, in the Jewish Targums was was referred to as a bull or an ox. And Dan was associated with the serpent. Well, these are all astrological constellations. So these are the constellations in the heavens, the Leo, the lion, the man with water, Aquarius, the bull, the ox, the Taurus, and the serpent, eagle, is Scorpio. You know, these are the four cardinal points of the Babylonian Zodiac or the Maseroth, as they referred to it in the book of Job that we just talked about. But keep those in mind as we read God's instruction to the Israelite camp. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 3, Judah was to the east. Verse 10, Reuben was to the south. Verse 18, Ephraim was to the west. And then verse 25, Dan was to the north. 
you know, I'd already knew that this was a giant moving cross, you know, back in 2012 with one of uh, Trey Smith's videos. But with the Levites in the center at the holiest of holies where the presence of God rested, where on the Day of Atonement they would sprinkle the blood, the sacrifice on the ark at the center. So this was a huge cross with them sprinkling blood in the center of the cross on the Day of Atonement, saying the hidden name of God, which was yod heh vav -Hey, which means behold the hand, behold the nail. I mean, that that's already just mind blowing yeah. yeah. But I never realized the astronomical stuff until uh, Doug Van Dorn pointed it out. You know, these are the four tribes listed that were on the outside of the four points of the camp, that their father aligned them with animals that were constellations that aligned perfectly like a mirrored image of the heavens of the four cardinal points of the zodiac. So it was this huge moving cross with those four tribes at the four corners of that mirroring heaven. I mean, that's that's pretty wild. It's a, it's those same things when and who was it? Uh, who was it that said that that? Um, I think it was when was Doctor Heiser always said that there there's always at least two meanings, right? When you see yeah. something and you're reading through, like there's usually something else. There's always the superficial. And then there's at least some, at least one other layer that, and, and usually more when you go through and you look and you can see all those different things. And a lot of them were meant for us to see uh, uh, retrospectively. Like we're not, you know, a lot of those things that you, you can even look at through. And we were talking, we talked about it in church today, but looking through Jesus, how many times did he tell them that he was going to die and resurrect? He, oh yeah. He told them over and over and over again, yet they couldn't see it so it's the same thing these things are some of these things god did not only was he telling them but the whole point is that we we see these things later on that helps us see the truth strengthen and, and our faith it strengthens yeah. our faith it shows us the scriptures and, and you can see physical things around you parts of creation that prove what the bible is telling you and it just is exactly what you said it just continues to strengthen my faith and hopefully everybody else out there too yeah can you guys think of any other uh, mirrored images uh, on earth as it is in heaven, like temple complexes or anything like that? Oh, that goes. That's, that's rabbit holes for days. Oh, yeah. I'm that's, just saying just off the top of your head, can you think of any just discussion? There, There's a big three. It's pretty, pretty obvious. Well, go ahead. Start us off. The pyramids of Egypt. Lines with the belt of Orion. Orion. And then also the the Nile that flows beside of it mirrors the Milky Way galaxy. That's tell me how these stupid ancient people knew this stuff. Not only that, it actually you know was considered the lifeblood. Yeah. So, I mean, just it, there's you can go down and um, look through this. I think we went through a a few other ones last time. The like Machu Picchu and the top of so we're talking about ancient cultures that are supposed to be you know fairly primitive. Yeah. That obviously we're not as primitive, you know, when we look at like Gobekli, like with the Aaron Judkins. But when you look at uh, Machu Picchu, there's a stone at the very top that's perfectly aligned north, south, east, and west, and that on the summer or and the winter or yeah, the spring and the fall solstice, I think it is, or summer and winter solstice, I can't remember. But they just those two days at a certain time, there's absolutely no shadow this stone casts, but this only on those two days. Like it's just un the, that they're able to set these th things up based on the the stars and the alignment, the the knowledge that they had to possess, and 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 the you know ability. What Stonehenge? Isn't that something? It is the that's on the I think that's the summer solstice where it rises over the like the headstone pillar. I think on the one end. I can't remember. Exactly. I don't know how it all works, but I know they set it up for some but reason. So many things yeah. were set up with the with the summer solstice. Was it Gilgal uh, Gilgal Raphaim? Yeah. There's a the the very center of that on that on that solstice the sun shines in just at that at that one part right in the middle like just at that one day a year, I mean there's so many places, uh, pretty much all ancient architecture when you talk about the stuff that's still standing the the stuff that we can see has some kind of astrological astronomical significance to whatever their religion would have been at that time whatever they believe but. Everybody always looking to the sky, the stars, the things above us, even if it wasn't necessarily um, uh, from a, a Christian point of view. I not say Christian, but from a, you know, at that point, a, a Hebrew Israelite, you know, from a godly 
point of view, a lot of times it was from those, I believe, like you said, those fallen angels had distributed that knowledge and, and perverted it. Yeah. Yeah, but it was they, their way of worship. But they still used it. Yeah. Well, it's like the uh, the Serpent Mound in Ohio. Oh, yeah. You know, it's built perfectly to eat the egg, which is the sun, during the summer solstice on sunset. Mm-hmm. You know, they got plenty of videos and pictures and stuff of that online you could go see. I mean, just look at Indiana Jones movies. <laughs> <laughs> If you have the staff and put it in the ground on the right day at the right time, it'll show you. Yeah, the opening or whatever. To the Ark of the Covenant. Are you trying to find a way to afford your favorite Bible scholar's next book? Are you searching for the next biblical research book to fill your shelves? Then if you want to justify a $35 plus shipping and handling expense to your spouse, look for savings on your home and auto insurance at the Better Insurance Agency. We can evaluate your insurance rates with multiple carriers to find you the best deal with the best coverage. Because if history has shown us anything, it's that the biblical narrative is real and that you'd better have a good excuse for your spouse on not on getting yet another book by Dr. Judd Burton. So choose the Better Insurance Agency and visit us at www.thebetterquote.com today. But in Cambodia, the temple uh, in Kar Wat was laid out to the constellation Draco, Mm. which is the dragon that sweeps away one-third of the stars of heaven. Who would that be? Which we'll get to that Who would that be? Yeah. This, uh, as Trey Smith said in our episode, this, uh, this dragon seems to be branding himself throughout the world keeps popping up everywhere but uh we talked about with dr aaron judkins how they're even dating these complexes because how the tilt of the earth is changing in the northern point is you know the poles are slightly shifting and stuff like that and that's how they're dating these places and uh we even talked about with uh, Stephen on the last episode how uh what was it you said uh, draco or hydra was the, was the polite was the north point at one point it was draco draco Acronis. and everything everything revolved around it yeah that's the same thing and that's stuff that we talked about before chichen itza with the mayans and mexico spring equinox um it shows on the side of the pyramid the way they the way they made it just on the spring equinox it made a serpent that was crawling up the stairs you had to eat the sacrificed heart <laughs> it was it, the return of the sun serpent and then you got the chaco canyon in new mexico which there's a lot of unique history and, and kind of dark history that goes along with that area. But uh, the Pueblo people, they had um, all these carved images in the rocks that showed how they were tracking the seasons and the passage of time based on the stars. I mean, you see this throughout the everybody. I mean, it, it's just, it's part of ancient culture. The stars were such a big point to the point where, I mean. Well, they even used it to navigate ships at night. I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah. But it's just, well, I mean, they still do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, well, now <laughs> but, satellites mean, probably. But. Well, there is, there is uh, you know, GPS now and whatnot. But you see, you can look even, you know, the different sextant. Different kind of stars, I guess. And the sextant and the different things that they use to, to navigate by the stars. And actually, you know, there was even, there's myths of the um, the Vikings being able to use the, the stars in the sky, or I'm sorry, the during the day with the sunstone. Yeah. Um, where they could, in a cloudy day, they could still use it, and it would still be able to use this sunstone in a particular way to help them navigate, even on a cloudy day, which is pretty crazy. But even in Canada, there was a kid recently that uh, found lost Mayan cities that was buried in the jungles of South America by overlaying the constellations over a Google Earth map. Lots of the cities lined up perfectly astronomically, and he found other lost cities by filling in the gaps. You know, how did ancient peoples, like we talked about, how did they know this? You know, they didn't have telescopes and all the satellites and modern advances that we have today. You know, ancient aliens show says that they had help, you know, by an extraterrestrial. Mm. You know, all the ancient people say that they were from the stars, you know, and that these gods from the stars visited them and gave them this knowledge you know the bible says that it's fallen angels same story just a different title we talked about that with timothy alberino different verbiage yeah but i love how timothy alberino explained it you know he said you know what is an extraterrestrial it's something advanced and not of this world you know gods angels demons satan 
are not of this world. So by textbook definition, they are extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. You know, when the sons of God, you know, how they correspond with the stars and the planets, it makes a lot more sense in light of Deuteronomy 32 worldview where the peoples were divided amongst the sons of God and that Paul was talking about in Romans when we traded the truth for a lie and worshiped the created things instead of the creator. And if you go back to these horoscopes, you're going back under the uh, the law or the chains of these other lowercase g gods and giving them influence over you. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's it's always been, well, we always said that from day one, nothing new is under the sun, right? Yeah. These things that have always been there that people have worshipped that they've gone to, it's just been repackaged, it's being sold to us a different way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's the truth, and you can see that in so many different parts of our culture and our society and, and societies around the world. But uh, one thing I've wanted to talk about, uh, I just didn't really know when we could actually bring it up, but this is a perfect time, was uh, Ezekiel's vision. Mm. Wheels within wheels. The wheels within wheels. That story, you know, what does it say? It says that, you no. literally opened that right to it. Read Dang. it to us, Steve. Which part? You're there. You Just the, the wheels within wheels part, the description of it. I mean, he literally opened it right to the page. Well, some people ha- yeah, some people are good at sports. You know, some no, I'm people just are saying that's amazing. <laughs> that's like, hey, we need to read this. Um, so, hold on. I'm looking. Y'all planned that, didn't you? No, actually. <laughs> the Holy Spirit did. Living beings looked like bright coals of fire or brilliant torches. The lightning seemed to flash back and forth among them, and the living beings darted to and fro like flashes of lightning. As I looked at these beings, I saw four wheels touching the ground beside them, one wheel belonging to each. The wheels sparkled as if made of barrel. All four wheels looked alike, and they were made the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. The beings could move in any of the four directions they faced without turning as they moved. The rims of the four wheels were tall and frightening, and they were covered with eyes all around. Uh, When the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. When they flew upward, the wheels went up too. The spirit of the living beings was in the wheels, so wherever the spirit went, the wheels and the living beings went also. When the beings moved, the wheels moved. When the beings stopped, the wheels stopped. When the beings flew upward, the wheels rose up, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. And like you talked about you know, earlier with Mike Kaiser, something always has at least two meanings. So if you look back at, uh, I don't know what you would, a professional word for it is, but basically a... Uh, a pedestal that a throne sat on back in the ancient times. That's what he's describing there. And when you look at a picture of it, you can look them up. It's just like a small tabletop. And it's got wheels at the bottom of it to roll the, the throne around or whatever. But it's got those uh, four living creatures' faces on each leg of the stool. And it talks about, you know, not... Uh, turning their faces as they went because it's rolling and they're facing out to the four corners. So they're talking uh, realistically about a throne. And he talked about how in that event there he's describing that the throne of God or the presence of God was leaving the temple. That it was showing the people that, you know, they defiled the name of God and rebelled and that his presence was was now leaving them but there's always a a deeper meaning you know or esoteric meaning and when you go with the the other side of that i think it's you know astronomical and talking about the constellations and uh mike heiser also talked about that but just a little background of all that before we get in i just have to read this and it's kind of lengthy and i apologize but uh you know, all the stars are fixed. They take the same course across the heavens night after night. They don't deviate out of God's will slash plan for them. But there are seven planets that do as thou wilt. 
and and quote unquote wander, as Jude puts it. Jude one thirteen says, Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. You know, this passage is clearly talking about the Genesis six fallen angels where the book of Enoch which Jude directly quotes several times, specifically says that they were put in chains of gloomy darkness. The context of the passage is about the false teachers that led the people astray, much like the fallen angels did. But these planets slash wandering stars are all named after pagan deities. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the sun, and the moon. You know, seven is a divine number symbolizing completeness. You know, we have seven spirits of God, seven days of creation, seven planets, Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam, seven archangels. You know, even in Mesopotamia, they had the seven Apkalu sages. You know, these quote-unquote set courses is what Ezekiel is referring to in Ezekiel 1 and uh, verse 16. With his vision of the wheels within wheels, you know, it is the stars and their set paths. You know, this entire vision is celestial. You know, even the four living creatures we discussed earlier with the uh, Israelite camp, we know that those four faces are the four cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. You know, this vision is similar to the vision John gets in Revelation. You know, it shows God sitting on his throne at the center of our universe, surrounded by the four cardinal points, the zodiacs of the heavens. Inside of these are wheels within wheels. The stars and their predetermined paths are, are highways in heaven. You know, God is showing that he is in control. And at the center of all time, space, and matter, surrounded by his divine counsel, who are compared to as stars. Even the word eyes, used in this context, says these wheels were full of eyes in verse uh, 18. That Hebrew word is ayin. You know, here's an excerpt from the article from the late great Dr. Michael Heiser off of his blog. The one thing I think most noteworthy about all this is the eyes. In Ezekiel 1, we read that the wheels were full of eyes. What does that have to do with the zodiac or astrology? Simple. The Hebrew word for eyes is ayin. This is the normal word for the body part through which we see. The same word is also used by Ezekiel, no less, in the same chapter to describe sparkling or gleaming in Ezekiel 1.4 and also 1.16. He said, here's a suggestion. Eyes should be understood in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 as stars, sparkling things. This fits amazingly well with chapter 10 since they're both the creatures and the wheels gave, or I'm sorry, the wheels have the eyes. You get it? Creatures, the cardinal points of the zodiac, the creatures having eyes, stars in them. What creatures have stars in them? the ones you see in the sky, the signs of the zodiac. And for kickers, this is also what the Apostle John says he saw in Revelation 4 through 5 when he looked up to the heavens, animals with stars in them. You know, with modern cameras, we can fix the camera towards a set star like the North Star and do a time-lapse video and easily see these same wheels within wheels. <laughs> nuts when you think about it I, my dad used to do that kind of my dad used to kind of do that photography all the time those those time lapse photos are the coolest things that you've ever seen and you get that fixed center point and everything spins <laughs> around it yep. yeah. yeah and it just looks exactly like you're saying it's just them wheel within a wheel within a wheel within a wheel but hmm. that's actually pretty interesting and going back a little bit further even when you're talking about the seven and being that sacred i think it's funny too well not funny i just another ironic thing when we talk about isn't it ironic <laughs> Isn't it somewhere it talks about wings having eyes all over it? We well, said the, the the creatures had wings, and it said that the eyes were all about, yeah, were all over them, yeah. So the but the, that was in Revelation, though I think. Yeah, the four through five. It's yeah. yeah. But the but it's when we go back to Job and we talk about where the two constellations that 
that you hear him talk about there is um, Orion, which he brings up Orion's belt, and he brings up the Pleiades, which it's, you know, Pleiades, what they're referred to very commonly is the seven sisters. Once yeah. again, seven stars, the seven sisters. You're seeing that same uh, replication of those, of that, that number seven, even though it's been changed to, to mean something different now in, in, in modern astrology. Or, or even astronomy, for that matter. It's got to be worth but, corrupting first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't mess with it if it wasn't worth, you know, messing up. Which, uh, I got the birth of Christ on here. I don't know if I should go into that or not. That's, I mean, we did a little bit of that with the last time, but, I mean, if it's part of the process. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a pretty big deal. But it, like I said, well, it's, it's, I mean, it's lengthy. The birth of Christ is kind of a big deal. Kind of. Kind of. He's got a big deal. He's got many leather-bound books. Yeah, he knows. Many, he knows many. Merle Olson. <laughs> you guys don't but, remember that movie? No. Oh no, yeah, you're showing your age. No, that's Anchorman. Never mind. I'll take that back. I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's oh, well, what I was yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't catch the, the <laughs> reference you <laughs> yeah, throw exactly. in there. But if we start with the like the birth of Christ, well, let's start with the wise men. You know, Matthew two. We're told they see the stars. Or they see a star that tells them that a king was born. You know, it says that they were from the east. You know, in esoteric movements, you know, the sun rises in the east, and that's said where wisdom comes from. Uh, but they quoted the prophecy from Micah 5.2. These wise men were from Babylon. You know, these were the sages and astrologers. They knew the scriptures of the coming Messiah because... They held the Jewish people in captivity there for many years and were exposed to their prophets and their writings. Daniel was one of the chief sages there while in captivity, and we talked about him a little bit earlier. But he interpreted dreams for the king and was exalted to a very high position. I'm sure he shared his knowledge of the prophecies and the stars in heaven that Yahweh placed there for signs and for seasons and wrote them down for him. Nobody knew and studied the heavens any better than these guys. This was no single star that led them to the Christ. This was something they saw coming way ahead of time and set out looking. This was a set of constellations and signs in the heavens that led them out, leading them. Uh, they knew the, the town because of the prophecies. We... We broke this down very well in a two-part episode on our podcast called Jesus of Nazareth, Part 1, but it covers the birth of Christ and all the astronomical stuff. But some great books on this subject is Dr. Michael Heiser's Reversing Harmon, uh, The Star That Astonished the World by Ernest Martin, and uh, Witness uh, of the Stars by E.W. Bullinger, which you touched on it on the last episode. But the book of Revelation in Chapter 12 is uh, what they say... Or what I'm sorry. The book of Revelation in chapter 12 is what they saw in the heavens and that led them to look for his birth. Revelation 12, 1 through 5. And a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed in the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains, and the agony of giving birth. And another sign in heaven appeared. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on its head seven diadems. His tail swept down one-third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule the nations with the iron or the iron rod. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. You know, John was caught up to heaven and back in time, and he's seen these events from heaven. This verse clearly says that he saw these signs in heaven. So, you know, these were astronomical. Number one, he saw the sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. This is the constellation Virgo. So these wise men saw Virgo with the sun placed inside the constellation. The sun would have to be located between 150 and 170 degrees along the ecliptic. This clothing of the sun in Virgo occurs for a 20-day period each year. 
This 20-degree spread could indicate the general time when Jesus was born. But the moon was also at her feet. This really narrows that window. Next thing they looked for was a crown of 12 stars on her head. This is the constellation Leo, and it has exactly 12 stars in it. It is also known for royalty, the king of the jungle, and the Christ was also known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But the next sign they had to look for was a great red dragon, standing before her waiting to devour the child. This is the constellation Hydra. The color red locates it in the southern sky. It sweeps away one-third of the stars, points to a location near his tail that is generally lacking in stars. But right above Hydra is the constellation Corax, which is the raven, and then Crater, which have seven and ten stars. Corax with seven, the number of the heads, lies close to Virgo, just beneath it. You know, since people have been mapping the stars since the dawn of time, and we know these heavenly bodies run the same course night after night, year after year, like a perfect clock. With our modern computers and software, we can rewind the hands of that clock to pinpoint dates astronomically. All these events happening at the same time gives us a very narrow window. But like I said earlier, the moon being at her feet really narrows that already small window. It's roughly a nine-minute window to astronomically pinpoint the birth of Jesus Christ. When we load all this information into an astrological software, we come up with the date of September the 11th, 3 B.C. That would put Mary's encounter with the angel of the Lord during Hanukkah, the festival of lights. So how fitting, the light of the world was announced at the festival of of lights, placing his birth during the Feast of Tabernacles, a week-long feast where the Jewish people dwelt in tents to remember the day of Exodus, when God tabernacled and dwelled with his people. Only this time, he was physically dwelling amongst them. It's crazy. I don't care how many times I read that or yeah, talk about that. it's That's wild. Just, makes the hair on your arm stand up you know it's just uh just amazing it does it just draws and, and you the closer time to frames like you can't make this up no man it's written in the stars <laughs> that's wild but i also have the uh, the crux and the cross and we touched on that a little bit in our last episode but just for uh Silly giggles in case I missed anything. We'll, we'll just go over it real quick. But but another interesting correlation with Jesus and the Son. You know, Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30, and he died at age 33. The Son is at its zenith, which means its highest point, at 30 degrees on the ecliptic. It starts its descent, or basically its death, at 33 degrees the summer solstice is the shortest day of the year during this time the sun halts its southward movement in the constellation of the crux and cross there it appears to hold still for three days then begins its ascent northward again to the right hemisphere the right hand of the throne of god many mystery religions use many correlations with Jesus and the Son and try to show that it's a copy or a retelling of an already universal truth. You know, that's why a lot of the mystery religions and occults, you know, hate Christianity so much. They believe it to be a perversion of their truth. But even though the Bible tells us in the very first chapter that God put the stars in the heavens for signs and for seasons, Acts 2, 19, I will show you wonders in heaven above. Psalms 19, 1, 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day to day it pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. As we've seen above, the heavens declared the coming of Christ. The perversion came from the fallen angels that told you 
that the power was in these created things and not the creator. Paul said we traded the truth for a lie. So Acts 7, verse 42, God turned us away and gave us over to worship the host of heaven. But talking about these events in the Tower of Babel, uh, Deuteronomy 32, through the blood of Christ you are set free from their reign and their power. To, and I said this earlier, to consult these things for influence on the future is to go back into bondage. God's voice is in the stars, the zodiac, the signs, and the, the truths of the Bible. You know, the, a good book on that is uh, Ken Fleming. But it's a great book, and it breaks down all the zodiacs and their deacons. Uh, it tells how the story of Christ is, is the story of Christ is written in the stars and in the story of salvation. But each of these twelve signs pictorially represent the prof prophetic events to the unfolding story of salvation in the history of the world. Isn't that the book that he was? Stephen was kind of talking out of. It might have been one of them. I know he was talking about I written in the stars which, which book and it was. a couple of other ones. But, yeah, that's another good one. Uh, God's Voice in the Stars, the Zodiac Signs and Bible Truth, Ken Fleming. But, yeah, he, he was referencing two or three books, but that might have been one of them. But uh, I heard Doug Van Dorn talk about it on a show, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool, was uh, – he even correlated the uh, seven churches of Revelation with uh, astronomical stuff. But he did a presentation with uh, Skywatch TV on the, the Defender Conference, and he talked about how the seven churches, starting off the book of Revelation, may have been correlated with the seven wandering stars. Interestingly enough, it's almost a mirror image of uh, Pleiades and their seven stars. Five and a half cities match up perfectly with the Pleiades. One is barely off, and but one city is just completely off. So I guess that's where he gets the half, where it's five yeah. and a half of the seven. But Ephesus, the largest city in Asia Minor, the sun is the largest star. In the letter, Jesus threatens to remove their lampstand, a.k.a. their light. Right. And it, it, Ephesus then was a big city, right? Yeah. Uh, Smyrna. Like the moon, it waxes and wanes. Jesus talks about being the first and the last. He died and came back to life. All these things akin, uh, it, akin it to the moon. Pergamum corresponds with Mars. Ares, the god of war. Jesus mentioned a sharp two-edged sword and that he will war against them with the sword of his mouth. Uh... Thyatira corresponds with Venus, the morning star, and it's flat out called the morning star in his letter. Sardis corresponds with Mercury. He was the god of thieves. And in that letter, Jesus says to them that he would come like a thief in the night. Yeah. Philadelphia corresponds to Jupiter, the king of planets. Jesus mentions the king in his letter. He also says he holds the key of David, the king to which he was prophesied to come. And uh, Laodicea corresponds to Saturn, known for its sluggish movement in the sky. In the letter, these people were described as lukewarm and talked about their sluggishness and how inefficient that they were. You know, the context of these letters uh, warns, warns about false teachers and false messiahs the same message of jude when he refers to them as wandering stars you know my opinion is that these wandering stars which represent actual entities that influence these false teachers and world leaders today by proxy but in revelation you have a lot of astronomical stuff too besides uh, just revelation 12 and the seven churches uh, but let's see but in chapter 1 of Revelation, in verse 17, it mentions the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and how that is most likely Pleiades. When we go down to chapter 4, we see a close look at the throne room of God. Isaiah 40 in verse 22 says, God sits on his throne above the circle or firmament of the earth. 
its inhabitants like grasshoppers, who stretches the heaven like a curtain. I think it's funny how Isaiah knew that the universe was expanding thousands of years ago before modern science, and we're just now figuring this out. But there we establish God's throne sits above the earth. In his throne room, uh, Revelation 4, 4 through 7, around the throne, on every side, we have 24 elders, which is the divine council. Jesus says in John eleven nine, 9, Are there not 12 hours in a day? So 12 and 12 is 24. You know, I believe that this is symbolic for time. You know, God sits at the center of all time. Verse 5 says, Before the throne sits seven torches of fire. Some believe it to be the menorah. Some say it's the seven spirits of God. I believe it could also mean the seven planets or wandering stars. Ezekiel 28 and Enoch both mention stones of fire that Satan and these angels walked amongst. Verse 6 talks about a sea of glass like crystal. You know, could this be, you know, the firmament that the throne sits on per Isaiah 40, 22? Verse 6 through 8 talks about the four living creatures on each side of the throne like guardians. That places the 24 elders outside of them. And we already discussed what these uh, living creatures were. They were the four cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. You know, so John was taken to the throne room of God where his throne sits on the firmament of earth like a sea of glass. Directly in front of the throne are the stones of fire, the seven planets, wandering stars, and then around are the four living creatures, the four corn, uh, corners of the zodiac on each side of the throne room, surrounded on every side by the 24 elders, the divine council, symbolizing the 24 hours in a day. So John was being shown before all the craziness of revelation that rolls out, assuring his people that God sits at the center of all time, space, and matter, and is in control. i never seen that before. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I've obviously you read about how it's set up, but actually trying to figure out why I've never... Because I always read it just like literally, okay, there's a throne... There's four living creatures. There's 24 people that around are weird it. Looking. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, it is what it is. It's literal. And then you get to digging a little deeper into symbolism and stuff like that, and it's just wild. It's just, you know, it's like John was taken up into outer space or given a vision of it anyway. Right. Looking down on everything as a whole, seeing the big picture. God's... You know, Earth, God's throne on top, the four constellations of the zodiac around him, then the 24 elders, the divine council, which is 24 hours in a day. That's all time, space, and matter, and God right in the center of it. It's definitely interesting. Yeah. But I haven't got it all ironed out yet, but I'll throw my little theory out. Just friends to maybe ponder on. Maybe one of you guys can figure it out for me. Send me an email. Let me know. Because this is something that I've threw around and postulated. But I've not really sat down and tried to work out. But the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Okay. A lot of people don't notice this. But the four horsemen are called out by these four living creatures. Not God. Every single time it says, you know, uh, the living creature says, you know, come forth. You know, so when I noticed this, I started doing some digging to see if there's any way that I can draw connections to these four riders or horses to these four constellations. You know, the search didn't turn out completely void, but still it's kind of open-ended and left for interpretation. But the first living creature, it calls forth a white horse. And it has a bow. You know, some think that this is Christ. But Christ comes later with a sword, not a bow. One entity in the ancient world that comes to mind is Reshef. 
the plague god, the god of war. It mentions a crown. The only constellation of the four that we are looking at here would have to be Leo. That's associated with kingship. So Revelation 12, Leo is the crown with 12 stars on the woman. Zechariah 6 mentions these same horses, but they have chariots. I believe these to be the same. In that passage, the white horse rides north from the throne of God. So I believe this first living creature to be Leo in the northern hemisphere. So that puts it around March, April, or May. You know, as spring progresses into summer, Leo drifts progressively to the west. But the second living creature calls forth the red horse who takes peace and makes war. This makes me think of Taurus the bull. Just beside of Taurus is Ares, you know, who is the god of war, ruled by Mars, the red planet. Zechariah 6 doesn't mention where this horse rides, but verse 7 says, When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth, so they went. Taurus is visible fall through spring in the northern hemisphere or spring through fall in the southern hemisphere. The third living creature calls forth a black horse and that it had scales. That looks like uh, weight scales, but the word in Greek actually means yoke, like a plow ox would wear, symbolizing slavery or bondage. The constellation Aquarius is depicted often with a yoke on its back carrying water. In Zechariah 6, we see this horse rides north with, with the white horse. Here we see a day's wage for uh, one meal. Aquarius can be found in the northern hemisphere during autumn or in the southern in the spring. And then the fourth living creature calls forth the pale horse and its rider's name is death and with it comes Hades he kills with the sword famine pestilence and wild beasts of the field this leaves us only with the Scorpio or the eagle death where is thy sting in Zechariah 6 we see that this horse rides south July and August it is located in the northern hemisphere and as summer wanes, it drifts southwest. The zodiac wheel goes counterclockwise with the living creatures giving the riders direction as constellations. Now, if my theory is correct, you can time the seasons of the coming of the horsemen. You couldn't predict their coming by no means. You know, no man knows the hour. You know, it would take someone who knows a lot more about stars than I do. But I found that there was, there was interesting correlations with the riders and these four living creatures, you know, if my postulations are correct. There's a lot of correlations with them that could be yeah. made. Yeah, yeah. Now, granted, you know, if the constellation wheel goes counterclockwise and we know which constellations are in the certain hemispheres at certain times of the year but just like in Zechariah it says you know this horse goes north or this horse goes this horse goes south that clock continually goes around and around and around so even if the pale horse is released in the southern hemisphere that doesn't mean the next time the next horseman comes to the right hemisphere that it's the same time it, you know I mean it yeah, you just don't know. I mean, it could be. That, yeah, I don't think we're we're not meant to know. Meant to know, yeah. But I just thought the correlations it's still were trying cool. to try to figure out. <laughs> it's fun to postulate, <laughs> right? But uh, that's it, guys. I got uh, a couple other little things, but you guys can dig on your own and get your own stuff. But we just wanted to. We talked about how the story of salvation in Christ was written in the stars. That I thought was wild. Yeah. So I just wanted to go through the Bible and show you places in the Bible 
were constellations and uh, zodiacs and stuff like that were mentioned that maybe you might have looked over. Keep digging. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Dig Bible Podcast. Don't be like a county worker. Get in that hole and dig some. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and check out our YouTube channel. See ya.